Welcome to Open Borders for growth uh, session. In this panel, we're going to talk about uh, increasing growth in times of austerity. I have very uh, valuable uh, panelists here with me together here. Uh, World Economic Forum just uh, uh, came up with the Enabling Re uh, Trade Report. We'll start with the conclusions of the Enabling Trade Report. Mr. Lawrence here uh, from uh, Professor Dr. Robert Lawrence from Harvard Kennedy School. He consulted the report. Uh, so let's begin, Mr. Lawrence. What are the recommendations of the report and what are the results that are outlined in the report? Well, this report basically looks at trade not only uh, by looking at countries' trade policies, but also by looking at how well their customs work, their regulatory frameworks, their infrastructure, uh, their security. It tries to take a holistic view of what drives international trade. And we uh, provide benchmarks against which countries can compare themselves both within regions and globally. And the bottom line is that the very best countries uh, uh, turn out to be, uh, not surprisingly, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and some Scandinavian countries who have very good quality institutions, uh, but also uh, do well in, uh, low, in their tariff structure and uh, in their regulatory frameworks. We also find that uh, there are other countries, uh, even developing countries, who do very well. Chile in uh, Latin America would be one. Mauritius would be another country that scores very, very highly. So uh, generally, uh, countries in, in this region uh, fall into two big camps. Uh, the countries in the Gulf uh, have done very well. Uh, they've improved. Uh, of course, we think of Dubai, but the UAE, uh, Qatar, um, several, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, do well in enabling trade in our, our index. I think there are also a lot of, um, and by the way, Georgia also does, does very well um, in our index, coming 38th. So for a country at each level of development, it, it, it is performing well. I think we also need to be concerned, though, about countries that aren't doing so well. Because if we're going to talk about integration, we need to adopt that broader perspective. And I would say of particular concern as we look into the future um, are a, a, a few BRIC countries. Uh, if we look at Ru the Russian Federation, if we look at India, we see there a lot of room for improvement. Uh, to be sure, Russia has uh, joined the World Trade Organization, but nonetheless, uh, if we look at their institutional structures, if we look at how poorly their customs are operating, we, we really see sources for concern. So the bottom line is, um, and we've issued this report. Uh, there are 132 countries. Uh, they're rated in all of these dimensions. And it, it offers opportunities, even for the very strong performers, to see where they rank relatively and then to think how they can improve. So uh, Turkey, in this report, uh, ranks uh, 62nd. Uh, uh, and uh, Georgia, on the other hand, uh, ranks uh, 38. And we have, uh, we're lucky to have uh, uh, both of the countries' economy ministers here with us today. Uh, Minister Chalian, I would like to uh, start with you first. Uh, what, what, how do you, uh, uh, what, what's your answer uh, for Turkey ranking uh, uh, 62nd? And um, Turkey is located at the heart of the mega, reg uh, mega region. What's your vision for improving trade in this region? I'm going to Turkish Uchayos Airport. Evet öncelikle şunu ifade etmek istiyorum ki yapılan çalışmayı ülkelerin genel yapısı, fiziki yapısı, nüfusları ve coğrafi yapısı ile beraber de değerlendirmek gerekir. Tabii Türkiye olarak biz de gelmiş olduğumuz seviyeyi önemli, anlamlı bulmakla beraber Türkiye'nin çok daha fazla yatırım ortamını iyileştirmesi, çok daha fazla yatırım yapılabilir bir ülke haline gelmesi için yoğun gayret içindeyiz. Benim bakanlığıma bağlı olarak yatırım ortamını iyileştirme koordinasyon kurulumuz var. Ve bu koordinasyon kurulu yaklaşık 10 yıldır hizmet veriyordu. Ancak yeni dönemde benim bakanlığıma bağlanmasıyla beraber bir kere bu kurulun çalışma biçimini, yapısını değiştirdik. Kurulun üyelerinde yeni değişiklikler, önemli değişiklikler yaptık. Çünkü ben de sanayinin içinden, yatırımın içinden gelen biriyim. 
bir hadisa yatırımcının ve sanayicinin reflekslerini yaşayan biriyim. Yani empati yapmıyorum. Empati yapmama ihtiyaç yok çünkü ben zaten bu işin içinden, doğasından geliyorum. Ve şimdi yeni bir model, yeni bir sistem olarak yatırım ortamı iyileştirme koordinasyon kurulunda bir anlayış birliği içinde olduk. Önemli reformlar yaptık aslında. Tabii Türkiye'yi 10 yıl öncesinden bugünkü seviyeye getirdiğimiz zaman 10 yıl öncesinde ülkemize gelen doğrudan yatırımlar 1 milyar doları geçmezdi yıllık. Ve 1923'te Türkiye Cumhuriyeti kurulmuştu. 1923'ten 2003 yılına geldiğimiz noktada 80 yılda ülkemize gelen toplam uluslararası doğrudan yatırım 14,5 milyar dolardı. Ancak dönemimizde siyasi istikrarın sağlanması ve ekonomik istikrarın sağlanmasıyla beraber Türkiye'ye son 8 yılda 80 yılda gelen doğrudan sermayenin neredeyse 8 katı geldi. Yani biz 80 yılda almış olduğumuz toplam doğrudan yatırımı her yıl almaya başladık. Ve şu an itibariyle Türkiye'ye gelen son 8 yılda toplam doğrudan yatırım miktarı tam 115 milyar dolardır. Yani bu bizim kısa sürede yapmış olduğumuz reformlarla Türkiye olan ilgi alakayı ve bakışı son derece pozitif yönde etkilemiştir. Bu konuda önemli hukuk reformları yaptık. Bankacılık sisteminde önemli kambiyo rejiminde önemli değişiklikler yaptık. Türkiye bugün sermayenin ve karın serbest transfer edilebildiği bir ülke olmakla beraber etkin bir hukuk sistemine ve bürokrasinin çok fazla azaltılmasına gidecek olan önemli reformları yapmış olduğumuz bir ülke. Daha eksiğimiz var mı? Tabii ki var. Şu anda yatırım ortamı iyileştirme koordinasyon kurulunda gerek kamunun gerek özel sektörün temsilcileriyle birlikte alınmış olan kararları artık bundan böyle yeni sistemde direkt bakanlar kuruluna götürüyoruz. Ve bakanlar kurulunda ilgili bakanlara ve bakanlıklara Sayın Başbakanımızın huzurunda verilecek olan bakanlara görevlerle beraber bunları çok daha çabuk yapacağız. Ancak tabii Türkiye'nin parlamento yapısını da bu noktada iyi görmek lazım. Reformları çok çabuk çıkartabildiğimizi söyleyemem. Örneğin Türk Ticaret Kanunu bizim açımızdan son derece önemliydi. Türk Ticaret Kanunu benimle aynı yaştaydı. 1957 doğumlu bir kanundu. Ve biz Türk Ticaret Kanunu geçen yıl değiştirebildik. Ancak güçlü bir iktidar partisi olmamıza rağmen ve Büyük Millet Meclisi'nde yüzde 65 çoğunluğa sahip olmamıza rağmen eğer muhalefet desteği olmasaydı 1550 maddelik bir kanunu kısa bir süre içinde çıkartmak mümkün değildi. Yani reformları yapmak için çok önemli hazırlıklarımız, çalışmalarımız var. Fikri ve sinayi mülkiyet haklarından tutun. Gerek hukuki anlamda, gerek ekonomik anlamda, gerek mali anlamda birçok alanda çok önemli hazırlıklarımız var. Ancak bizim parlamentonumuzun isteği sürecinde muhalefet partileri sayıları az da olsa isterlerse süreci tıkayabiliyorlar. Çünkü parlamentomuzun çalışma sisteminden kaynaklanan bir şey. Yani biz mecliste, parlamentoda çoğunluk olan ve ciddi bir çoğunluk olan hükümet olmamıza rağmen kanunları zaman zaman çıkartmaktan muhalefetin engellenen dolayı gecikebiliyoruz. Bundan dolayı şunu ifade etmek istiyorum ki Türkiye şu anda içinde bulunduğu lojistiğiyle, coğrafi konumuyla ve 29 yaş ortalamasına sahip 75 milyon nüfusu ile bir kere Türkiye kendisi son derece iç pazarı kuvvetli olan bir ülke. Ve Türkiye kendisine 4 saatlik uçuş mesafesinde 56 ülkenin bulunduğu bir coğrafyada ve Avrupa Birliği'nde tam iyilik yolunda önemli hedefler, önemli atılımlar yapmış olan bir ülke olmakla beraber bugün Maastricht kriterlerinde ki Maastricht kriterleri Avrupa Birliği'nin ekonomik anayasasıdır. Avrupa'nın 23 ülkesinden çok daha iyi konumda bir kamu borçluluğuna ve Avrupa'nın 21 ülkesinden çok daha önemli, efektif bir bütçe açığına sahip. İşsizlik oranımız geçen yıl Avrupa'nın işsizlik oranının daha altında kaldı ve Türkiye her yıl nüfusu 1 milyon artan bir ülke. Her yıl 1 milyon insanın iş hayatına girmiş olduğu bir ülke. Ama tekrar ifade etmek istiyorum ki 2023 projeksiyonumuzda Türkiye'yi dünyanın ilk on ekonomisi içine sokmak istiyoruz. Bunun için bir taraftan mevzuatlarımızı bir taraftan bürokratik yapımızı önemli reformlar yaparken 
yatırım ve yatırımcı için çok önemli mevzuat değişikliklerini hazırlarken, vergi konusunda önemli değişiklikler yaparken bir taraftan da altyapımızı, lojistiğimizi ve enerji yatırımlarımızı 2023 yılına göre dizayn ediyoruz. Sadece önümüzdeki 10 yılda Türkiye 130 milyar dolarlık enerji yatırımı yapılacak olan bir ülke olmakla beraber Türkiye şu anda demir yolunda da ulaşım alanında da 110 milyar dolar yatırım yapılacak olan bir ülkedir. Yani Türkiye'yi değerlendirirken nüfus ile beraber ve geçmişteki yaşamış olduğu ekonomik krizlerle beraber değerlendirdiğimiz zaman ben inanıyorum ki çok kısa bir süre içinde Türkiye bu sıralamada böyle beşer onar basamaklarla çıkarak gelecektir. Etkin bir istikrar var siyasi anlamda, ekonomik anlamda, hukuk anlamda ve Türkiye bir tabii demokratik ülke olmanın da getirmiş önemli avantajlara sahip. Ama ben bu konuda ilerleyebileceğimizi yapmış olduğumuz çalışmalardan ve kararlılığımızdan dolayı sizlerle çok rahat şekilde paylaşabilirim. Teşekkürler. Thank you, Minister Çağlayan. And uh, I would like to ask you, Minister Kobalia, she is the Economy Minister of Georgia, how do you uh, comment on Georgia ranking 38 uh, on the index, I mean trade index of the WEF Forum? Uh, what do you say about that? And how do we use the trade uh, to enhance growth of Georgia, you know, uh, development and uh, improvement of life in the, in the uh, region? Uh, in terms of being the 38, I believe that we need to do more in, in order to be in the top 10. Um, this is our goal always. The same thing with uh, being in the uh, top 20 in the World Bank uh, ease of doing business. We are number 16 this year, and our goal is in, uh, to be in the top 10 in the uh, upcoming years. Why is that important? Because Georgia is a country where we don't have natural resources, such as oil and gas, for example. So we have to be very creative about how we develop our sectors of economy. And uh, we have to make sure that all the links and uh, in the uh, chain the value chain of our economy are strong because um, just as well as the report mentioned is that um, your uh, chain uh, is just as strong as the weakest uh, link in the chain. And it's very important to know that, that if not all the parts uh, of the development um, are not developing in the uh, similar uh, structure and uh, similar speed, then uh, you're just as weak as the weakest point in your supply chain. So it's important that um, we highlight uh, often when we talk about development of our economy, diversifying ev in everything that we do. Um, so uh, to us, it's important that all the sectors of economy are diversified, that when we talk about transport and logistics and when we talk about trade, it's just uh, one of the components of our economic development. When we talk about trade, it's important that we make sure that our ex export potential is just as diversified as well, and when we talk about export markets that they are also just as diversified to make sure that we're not dependent on one region or another for our export um, of our products. So what are we doing uh, for uh, sustaining this uh, growth that we have today? Uh, last year we had 7% growth in our uh, economy. The year before we had 6.5% growth. And I truly believe that the main uh, reason was uh, diversification of sectors um, and uh, fight, of, uh, fight with corruption in our country, which has uh, boosted uh, confidence for FDI and uh, boosted confidence of uh, local business to reinvest uh, in our economy. So uh, main um, components on the government side is uh, uh, investing in infrastructure and making sure that basic infrastructure is um, uh, there in order for business to build on top of uh, this, uh, so to say, railroad and uh, um, uh, the needs that they have. So what we've done is over the past years, we've invested heavily in roads, uh, highways, re highways, rehabilitation of uh, the uh, railroad. We uh, are currently in the process of moving a large portion of the uh, railroad that runs through the center of the uh, capital uh, uh, for the outside of the city to make sure that it's um, uh, faster and more uh, efficient. Um, and I think the one of the most important uh, also components was uh, reforming the customs procedures uh, in the country. 
what it did is um, uh, because we are a transit country and because our economy does depend on uh, transit of goods being the shortest route from Central Asia uh, to Europe uh, for transit of goods, we had to uh, make sure that custom procedures are quick and efficient so that business chooses uh, Georgia as a transit route uh, for their uh, needs. So um, we realized that uh, there are many components in order to uh, create more efficient custom procedures. And one of them, of course, was uh, the people that work in the uh, customs uh, offices on the borders. So we made sure that we uh, hired new uh, young professionals that are uh, working towards uh, servicing uh, people that uh, go through the customs. And everything is done electronically, so we avoid um, any uh, unnecessary mistakes or uh, inefficiencies in the process, uh, which uh, all of this led to average time uh, on the borders uh, uh, to pass with any type of goods uh, to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So uh, average uh, of 15 minutes uh, has uh, created, um, as you can imagine, a lot of uh, efficiency, but also what it has created is we've seen new products uh, such as uh, automobiles, for example, coming up as uh, number one export product on the list of export products in Georgia, and we don't produce any cars. So uh, what happened is we all of a sudden became a country of re-export of goods, and many our, of our neighboring countries, such as Azerbaijan, uh, Kazakhstan, uh, Armenia, they come to Georgia to do their uh, trade, Mm -hmm. And uh, then they travel back. And many times it's small and medium business, but this is what we want to base our economy on, is that we are uh, a trade uh, uh, hub for um, our Caucasus region. And so that uh, in order to be a trade hub, we provide efficiency and we provide uh, not only ease of doing business, but also cleanliness of doing business in our country, which has resulted uh, to being 38, mm -hmm. but hopefully in upcoming years being in the top 10. But uh, of course, it also means that we have to reform constantly, and this is the key to um, everything, is uh, updating your system all the time, making sure that uh, you are not happy with what you have today, but mm -hmm. uh, implementing new technologies, investing into education, and investing further into infrastructure. Uh, thank you, Minister Kobaya. As Georgia aspires to be uh, a trade hub, let's hear from the business side uh, what uh, the business side thinks of improving trade in the region. I would like to ask a question to Beat Simon. He's the CEO of uh, Agility, uh, a major logistic company, a, a European company in the region, but who does lots of business in the region. Uh, so, uh, min, uh, Mr. Simon, what do you say about uh, improving trade in the region? Maybe I think uh, I want to elaborate a little bit more on the soft facts. First is the stability of the financial and political uh, environment. I think this is key to success in trades. And uh, if you see it also normally when the environment gets more difficult, governments tend to focus very much on national interests. And especially in these complex environments, I think it's really needed to get a broad view. And uh, I liked very much the elaboration this morning of uh, the Turkish Prime Minister, how he sees the views and how he sees a broader view. And I think that is also the future. Why? You see, for instance, the subprime crisis in the US impacted US, but also European banks, and had substantial impact on consumption in the US and on international trade on the Trans-Pacific, on the Transatlantic. You see the government debt crisis we have in Central Europe, whereas especially the South European countries, they overspend for decades and now they have to save. Now, from my perspective, yes, they need austerity, but you still have to grow. So there has to be a balanced view on, on how you approach savings because a big part of the European GDP relates to government spending. Also at the same time, another problem you have is you see the busts of the housing or real estate bubble in Spain. And at the same time, we face problems like in Switzerland where we are kind of trying to avoid to have a building up of a new bubble. And I think to, to really top it, at the same time in the Middle East, you have the Arab Spring, 
which is certainly nice in the midterm, but for the business it's uncertainty. And kind of if to have an overall on that one, political and financial stability is really key to uh, uh, drive growth between the regions. Another one is, of course, consumer confidence. Uh, I think it starts with each of us nowadays, if you open the newspaper, uh, very early in the morning, it's uh, not exactly uh, positive. So maybe also here uh, would be nice to see more optimism from all the stakeholders. There's so many things happening in Turkey, in Georgia, in the many, many countries that still have a lot of positive positive news, but if you open the news, they're mainly focusing on the negative. So, so I think if people are concerned to lose the job, they're not going to buy a new car, they're not going to go to vacation to Turkey, they're not going to go to Spain or to Greece. So I think confidence next to political and financial stability are key factors. And another one for the business community is especially for the small and medium-sized companies access to cash. It's, it's, it is nice if the European Central Bank announces that the interest rates are very low. However, if there is no financing from the banks to the, to the smaller companies, you can have a good product, you can generate a good profit. If you have no working capital, you're not going to do any business. So I think here definitely we have to assure that the money also reaches the, the smaller companies who really kind of drive the business. Mm -hmm. So I think that is more or less how I see the key soft factors that drive uh, trade. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Simon. We have one more participant from the business world. Uh, Mr. Malas is here with us. He's the CEO of Majid Al Futam Group from United Arab Emirates. His uh, firm is a leading shopping mall retail leisure pioneer across MENA region. Uh, Mr. Malas, what are the major challenges of goods distribution in the region, particularly uh, in the, uh, regarding uh, uh, the market ac uh, access? Uh, I mean, clearly there are uh, many differences across countries, so it's very difficult to generalize. Uh, I think if we want to cover some of the major ones, I think uh, there is still an issue around poor infrastructure, and there I would say uh, two major elements typically. It's the logistics centers, which a company like Agility is trying to cover, and others, but there is still a huge demand for improved logistics, which is very important in the supply chain, uh, and, and that's one factor. The other related infrastructure issue is uh, that of of uh, the road uh, uh, and rail infrastructure within the countries, especially landlocked countries, which then uh, have very uh, difficult access to sea uh, and, and, and markets. The other uh, aspect which is related is uh, inadequate either port or airport operations, and, and that's very important. And therefore, it's not very surprising to see, in fact, in the top five markets, countries like uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, Dubai, uh, leading the way uh, in terms of having uh, state-of-the-art uh, airport and port facilities because that is really the role they play on a, on a regional basis. Uh, in addition to that, and I think uh, Minister Kovalia covered some of that, I think uh, excessive uh, um, uh, regulations or, if you like, uh, excessive requirements uh, clearance requirements are, uh, are always uh, an issue, uh, and documentation uh, in some of the countries is an issue. Uh, in fact, according to the uh, latest uh, uh, IFC bank report, uh, doing, uh, ease of doing business report, the MENA region requires 6.3 documents to uh, actually have a, an export, while OECD requires 4.4. Similarly, on imports, which is actually quite interesting, is even higher uh, requirement. To, there you have 7.6 documents in the MENA region, while in uh, OECD countries is 4.8 uh, uh, points. Uh, then you have a very burdensome and time-consuming uh, custom clearance process. And, and again, there, if we uh, look at the latest statistics, you see that uh, time it takes uh, about 19.7 days to export uh, out of MENA region when that is 10.5 days in the OECD countries. And on imports, it's even higher. It takes 27.6 days uh, to uh, get a whole uh, import transaction in the MENA region as opposed to 10.7 uh, in, in OECD. Uh, 
uh, then you add to it the uh, other element which uh, Mr. Simon factored, uh, which are uh, issues around border issues, which sometimes are related to politics, and, and then uh, you have trucks waiting to cross borders for weeks and weeks, and that's very expensive for business. Uh, you have lack of financing. You still have issues also around uh, foreign ownership, uh, especially in the GCC, and that's also a general burden to uh, doing business, but also a burden to facilitating trade and setting up uh, businesses in the region. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Malas. We heard from uh, the three sides, government, business, and academia. Uh, I would like to ask you, Inger Anderson, she's the vi Vice President of uh, Middle East North Africa of uh, World Bank. How can we help civil society, business, and government achieve optimal results of uh, trade uh, in the region? You know, all of these things, they come together very nicely because although we're talking very different countries, there are certain things that are sort of uh, similar across the board. One thing is, what is this all about? It's about jobs. Jobs, jobs, jobs, jobs, jobs. That's what people want. How are we going to drive those jobs? Well, to get to that, we have to get at growth, right? Mm -hmm. So what kind of growth is it? And part of that, so what is the growth story going to be? Clearly, trade is very important, and I'll get to that. But also, foreign direct investment is absolutely significant as is the kind of economies that we design, how open, the flexibility that you are talking about, how, how speedily can you get mm -hmm. your, uh, your things across the border and so on, all these rankings that we, that we all cite. Because it is, of course, an obvious case if I have access to the cash, if I can move my goods across the border, well, then my economy will grow. So these things come together. And then a story that was an undercurrent of the Arab Spring, of course, was about exclusion or inclusion. Is this just an economy for the few or is it an economy for everybody? And so, um, and finally, maybe the skills that we produce in these societies. What kind of skills do we graduate out of universities and colleges? Are they actually the skills that, that the job market needs? In the Middle East and North Africa, there is a disconnect. The private sector says they can't find, the, they can't fill their vacancies. And we all know that in many of the Middle Eastern countries, the more educated you are, the more likely you are to be unemployed. So there is, a, there is not a skills match here. So when you ask about what we can do, mm -hmm. well, on the trade story, there's a very important uh, thing to be done. And part of it deals with this uh, regulatory framework. But we also have economies that are essentially distorted in many of the Middle East and North African countries. So what do I mean by that? Well, in a way, um, we have in many Middle Eastern countries uh, and North African countries, big government, very big government. 25% uh, on average is the employer um, of government. Much smaller in, in comparative countries, around 10, 16%, and so on. So very big government. Uh, that, that distorts the whole thing, and very small manufacturing. So if you have a tiny manufacturing sector, and that's where you have the job intensive uh, sector, then clearly that's a, that's a point. 10% or so is manufacturing in, in the Middle East. I was looking for Malaysia, for example, 20%. So that's an inverse relationship. So when you look at all of this, it's about the structure of the economy. We also in the Middle East are subsidizing energy very heavily. Mm -hmm. When you subsidize energy, what tends to happen is that you then drive energy intensive product production lines. These are generally labor poor. Whereas if you tax labor and, subsi and not subsi uh, uh, so what's happening with subsidizing energy and taxing labor, so we get labor, po labor poor investments, whereas we want labor rich investments. So there is a story around the whole aspect of the structure of the economy. But then, a second point will deal around, the, and that's in, in short to your, to your question, civil society. Well, these economies will grow if we have transparency, better governance. Uh, the sun is the best disinfectant. Mm -hmm. And so the more light we throw on things, the better we will have, the, we'll drive down corruption, we will have more open media, people will be accountable, there will be a, a greater degree of social cohesion. So these are the kind of elements that need to come into play. And I think that whilst we've seen a dip uh, in, uh, in growth 
in many of our, our Middle East and North African countries as they've gone through this transition. When we look at, at, at longer term, and you're right, uh, short term we are seeing a little bit of a drop in, in growth, but longer term this will anchor pluralism, this will anchor a stronger social contract, and then therefore this should anchor the business environment provided these reforms are made that I mentioned. Well, thank you, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Anderson. So uh, jobs, jobs, jobs, as you said, uh, trade needs to create jobs, not decrease jobs. And uh, business environment needs confidence level. And the less the documents, the better, of course, as governments work on uh, reforms to uh, promote trade in the uh, region and uh, in their countries. Uh, Minister Chalian, I would like to uh, continue uh, with you. Let's start the second uh, session. Um, how can the region's production and service capabilities uh, fit into the global uh, value chains? Uh, what do you say about that in terms of uh, reforms improving trade in the country, in the region? Evet, şöyle bir kere tespit etmemiz gerekiyor ki 2008 küresel krizi aslında dünyanın ekonomik ekseninde de bir kayma oluşturdu. Aslında son 10 yıldır Dünya ekonomisinde çok farklı farklı gelişmeler var. Bir kere bu bana göre sürecin doğal bir seyriydi. Çünkü geçmiş yıllarda, önceki yıllarda gelişmiş olan ülkeler gelişmekte olan ülkelere mal satan bir konumdaydı. Yani akımlar kuzeyden güneye giderdi. Ama şimdi bilhassa içinde Orta Doğu'nun, Kuzey Afrika'nın ve Avrasya coğrafyasının olduğu coğrafya bana göre son derece Önemli bir coğrafya ve bu noktada dünya ekonomisindeki bilhassa kaymanın, eksen kaymasının gelişmiş ülkelerden gelişmekte olan ülkelere kaydığını görüyoruz. Bundan ay öncesine kadar gelişmiş olan ülkelerin dünya ekonomisindeki payları yüzde 60-65'ler seviyesindeydi. Bugün gelmiş olduğumuz noktada gelişmekte olan ülkelerin Türkiye'nin de içinde bulunduğu Hindistan, Çin, Brezilya gibi ülkelerin de içinde olmuş olduğu ülkeler şimdi dünya ekonomisinde gelişmiş olan ülkelerle hemen hemen eşit seviyede dünya ticaretine söz sahibi ve hakimler. Ama gelecek 10 yıl gelişmekte olan ülkelerin dünya ticaretinden yüzde 60'lar üzerinde pay alacağı öngörüsüyle şu anda görüşülüyor. Ve diğer taraftan bilhassa Türkiye'nin içinde bulunduğu bölgeyi iyi bir incelemek lazım. Türkiye ifade ettiğim gibi 4 saatlik uçuş mesafesinde 56 ülkenin olduğu bir coğrafyada ve bu 56 ülkenin olduğu bu coğrafyada tüketim kalıpları, tüketim alışkanlıkları, üretim kabiliyetleri, ekonominin genel seyrinde çok ciddi değişimler, değişiklikler var. Bilhassa biz komşularımız da Kuzey Afrika ile, Orta Doğu ile ve Avrasya ekonomisiyle ki 17 yıldır gümrük birliği anlaşması yapmış olduğumuz Avrupa ile ticaretimizi her geçen yıl arttırıyoruz. Ancak Türkiye Avrupa'nın içinde bulunduğu ekonomik krizin getirmiş olduğu talep daralmasıyla ihracatımızın Avrupa içindeki payı geçen yıl yüzde 46 iken bu yıl yüzde 41'ler seviyesine düşmüş olmasına rağmen Cumhuriyet tarihimizin en yüksek ihracatını yapmaya devam ediyoruz ve Geçen yıl 135 milyar dolar mal ihracatı yapan, 40 milyar dolar da hizmet ihracatı yapan bir ülkeyiz. Şu an itibariyle son 12 aylık Türkiye ihracatı, mal ihracatı 140,5 milyar doları geçmiştir. Burada Türkiye'nin bilhassa içinde bulunduğu bu bölgenin gerek tarihi kültürel bağlarımız, gerek bilhassa ırki ve dini bağlantılarımızın olması, hemen hemen birçok ülkenin aynı kökten geliyor olmamız ve Türkiye'de siyasi istikrarın 2002'den sonra sağlanmış olması, bilhassa bölgesinde barış ve huzuru isteyen ve bunu önemseyen bir anlayışa hakim olması, bir kere Türkiye'yi bölgede son derece önemli bir konuma getirmiştir. Bakın New York'tan Seattle'a 5 saatte gidebilirken, Türkiye'den 4 saatlik uçuş mesafesinde 56 ülkeye gidebiliyorsunuz. Bunun içinde Kuzey Afrika'da, Orta Doğu'da, Avrupa'da ve Avrasya coğrafyasının da olduğunu dikkatine gitmek isterim. Ve bu coğrafyada bir buçuk milyar insan yaşıyor. 
bu coğrafyada dünya milli gelirinin üçte biri oluşturuluyor. Ve bu coğrafya toplam dünya ticaretinden, ithalatından yüzde 46 pay alıyor. Yani 8,5 trilyon dolarlık ithalat bu bölgede yapılıyor. Bizim Afrika ile olan ticaretimiz bundan 8 yıl önce bugün gelmiş olduğu seviyeye baktığımız zaman yaklaşık 5 kattan fazla artmıştır. Bugün Türkiye'nin Afrika ile olan ticaret hacmi yaklaşık 20 milyar dolara yaklaşmıştır. Komşularla ticaretimiz bundan 8 yıl öncesinin 4 katından fazla artar bir hale gelmiştir. Ki nitekim bunu gerek Avrupa gerek diğer ülkelerde görmek mümkün. Çünkü günümüz dünyasında sanayinin içinden gelen biri olarak bir kere üretimin çok ani operasyonlarla yapılması gerektiğini yani just in time üretimde olmaz olmaz olduğunu bilinciyle en yakın tedarik merkezi olmanız sizi bir kere bölgede son derece önemli hale getiriyor. Diğer yandan Türkiye'nin de içinde bulunduğu bahsettiğimiz coğrafyada ki buna biraz daha belki Asya Pasifik'e doğru götürürsek bu coğrafyada önümüzdeki 10 yılda 1 milyara yakın insan düşük gelirli gruptan, insan grubundan orta gelirli bir insan grubuna transfer olacak. Yani bu insanların tüketim kalıpları ve tüketim ihtiyaçları değişecek. Türkiye sadece mal ticareti değil, hizmet ticaretinde de son derece önemli bir oyuncu. Bakın Türkiye'ye geçtiğimiz yıl 31,5 milyon turist geldi. Ve Türkiye tarihinde ilk defa 23 milyar dolar turizm geliri elde etti. Ve Türkiye bu başarıyla dünyanın 6. büyük Avrupa'nın dördüncü büyük turizm destinasyonu oldu. Yine aynı şekilde bugün Türkiye sağlık turizminde ve sağlık sektöründe çok iddialı bir şekilde her geçen gün başarısı artan bir ülke. Bugün Avrupa'nın bilhassa yaşlanmış nüfusu ve Avrupa'daki sağlık sisteminin bilhassa sosyal güvenlik sistemin içinde bulunduğu ciddi sıkıntılar, çok uzun süreli hastaların bekleme süresi ve bu konuda Avrupa'nın birçok ülkesinin içinde bulunduğu ekonomik sıkıntılar ister istemez Türkiye'yi sağlık alanında çok önemli bir konuma getiriyor. Şimdi biz sağlık turizmi konusunda da önemli açılımlar yapıyoruz. Türkiye şu anda 170 üniversiteye sahip. Gerek özel sektör, vakıf gerek devlet üniversitesi olarak. Ve her yıl 700 bin gencimiz üniversitelerden mezun oluyor. Üniversitelerimizde de ciddi manada Türkiye dışından gelen gençlerimizin okuduğu, gençlerin okuduğu bir yapıya sahibiz. Diğer yandan müteahhitlik sektöründe Türkiye dünyada Çin'den sonra Sayın Başbakanımız da bugün ifade ettiler. Dünyanın ikinci büyük müteahhitlik ülkesi. Her yıl yapılan 225 uluslararası müteahhitlik firması içinde firmalarımız 30'un üzerinde firmayla her yıl yer alıyorlar. Ve bu yılda yani geçtiğimiz yılda 31 Türk firması 225 uluslararası müteahhit firma içinde Çin'in hemen arkasından dünya ikincisi oldu. Türkiye Bakın 94 ülkede 6511 projede 211 milyar dolardan fazla havaalanları, köprüler, üst, üst yapılar, alt geçitler, metro inşaatları başta olmak üzere dünyanın her yerinde çok önemli müteahhitlik hizmetleri yapmaya başladı. Mühendislik müşahilik hizmetleri yapmaya başladık. Ama asıl önemlisi biz tüm dünyada yapmış olduğumuz bu müteahhitlik hizmetlerinin neredeyse yarıya yakınlığı Kuzey Afrika ki Libya bilhassa bu konuda son derece önemli ve Orta Doğu'da gerçekleştirirken yine yapmış olduğumuz müteahhitlik hizmetlerinde çok önemli bir rakam ki yaklaşık 35 milyar dolar üzerinde bir rakamı da Rusya Federasyonu ve o coğrafyadaki ülkelerde yaptık. Yani bilhassa bölgemizde olan ilişkilerimiz son derece önemli. Bölgenin her geçen gün giderek artan zenginliği ama bunun yanı sıra önemli bir yeni bir devrime girildiği, yeni bir değişim ve dönüşümün yaşandığı demokratik zenginliğin de olmasıyla beraber bölge hem ekonomik anlamda hem demokratik anlamda önemli bir konuma gelecek. Yani içinde bulunduğumuz coğrafya, bilhassa Kuzey Afrika ve Orta Doğu coğrafyasında insanların sadece maddi zenginliklerden memnun olmadığı, demokratik zenginliklerin de istediği ve Arap Baharı ile beraber başlayan değişim ve dönüşüm etrafımızdaki ülkeleri çok da önemli hale getirecek. Bir önceki konuyla ilgili tek bir cümle etmek istiyorum. Tabii Türkiye'nin bu Dünya Bankası'nın iş yapılabilirlik sıralamasındaki yerinde 
Bilhassa gümrük konuları herkes tarafından dile getirilen bir husus. Bu, bu noktada tabii Türkiye 436 milyar dolarlık bir dış ticaret hacmine sahip. Ve 772 milyar dolar da geçen yıl birliği gelir olan bir ülkeydi. Bilhassa gümrükle ilgili ilişkilerde sizin ülkenizin gümrüklerinin çok iyi olması tek başına yetmez. Sizin çevrenizdeki ülkelerin gümrük konusundaki ne derece gelişmiş oldukları da bu konuda son derece önemli belirleyicidir. Sizin ülkenizin gümrükleri fevkalde gelişmiş olabilir. Ama sizin ülkenize dışarıdan gelen ürünlerde sizinle komşu olan ülkelerdeki gümrük konusundaki engellerde bu konuda önemli. Yani burada yapılacak olan yapılan çalışmaları sadece ülke bazlı bir çalışma olarak değerlendirirsek bu bir eksik bakış olur. Bunu 5 yıldır bakanlık yapan biri olarak ve diğer taraftan 27 yıl sanayicilik yapmış biri olarak söylüyorum ama son olarak söyleyeceğim cümle evet bölgemiz son derece önemli. Gerek ekonomik gelişimin gerek sosyal gelişimin artarak devam edeceği bir yönde ve Türkiye bölgesinde barışın huzurun tesis edilmesinde önemli bir rol ve talep içindeyken ekonomik anlamda da tam bir entegrasyondan yana ve komşularımızda daha fazla iş, daha fazla ticaret yapalım istiyoruz. Amerika'da Purdue Üniversitesi yapmış olduğu bir araştırmada dünya ticaretinin yüzde yirmi beşinin komşular arasında yapıldığını sonucunu ortaya koymuş. Bu noktada bizim de komşu ülkeler Çevre ülkeler stratejisi Kuzey Afrika ve bilhassa Avrasya coğrafyasında önemli stratejilerimiz ümit ediyorum ki bu coğrafyadaki ekonomik kalkınmayı, birlikte kalkınmayı çok daha çabuk sağlayacak. Sadece mesele Türkiye'nin değil, bölgenin kalkınmasında alınacak olan rol de son derece önemlidir. Uh, thank you Minister Chalian. Let's ask to our neighbor uh, Minister Kobaria, what would you like to add on the issue? How can the region's production and service capabilities fit into the overall global value chain? I uh, just wanted to add a few uh, on a few points that were mentioned earlier in the discussion. Um, one, I believe that uh, education is a very big part of everything that we're talking about because it was mentioned earlier um, that it's important that we have uh, skills matching in uh, uh, everything that we do. And this is what we're seeing in Georgia is a good example. What happened in the 90s is uh, we had um, a lot of students that were choosing um, professions such as um, uh, legal or <clears throat> economics or um, uh, medical, which, uh, which are all very important professions, but we ended up with um, no skilled labor and we ended up without uh, a strong uh, skill pool of uh, people with technical education. So um, what we've realized that we need to do more as government to uh, encourage uh, students to, to make the right choices for their future life, to make sure that they choose professions where they can be employed in the future and choose professions where uh, they can be a part of our growing economy. Because what is happening in a lot of sectors today in Georgia is you look at the construction sector or you look at the agro sector, we are lacking skilled professionals even though we still have high unemployment rate. So what we've done is um, we've done a lot of education back into the um, high schools uh, on the high school level uh, talking with students and encouraging them to choose technical education we're working with uh, MCC right now with the Millennium Challenge Corporation on the uh, future project of the uh, American Technical University in Georgia to make sure that there is more opportunities for students to mm -hmm. choose the right technical education and what we've seen is last year technical education education was the first choice of students uh, in comparison to uh, the years before. So this is already a result where in you know, five, ten years we're going to have the uh, labor pool strong enough uh, with technical and uh, also high uh, tech education where we can support the uh, type of um, investment that we're doing in the development of these sectors. And the second point uh, I wanted to touch upon is um, also uh, uh, that my colleague uh, mentioned is in terms of uh, the relationships that you have and the agreements that you have with your neighboring countries. We have a free trade agreement uh, with uh, Turkey which has resulted in huge trade turnover for our country mm -hmm. uh, between uh, Turkey and Georgia. Turkey is our number one trade partner and in a large portion to the result because we have efficiency but on the border but also because we have these type of agreements and uh, for example 
example, you don't need a passport to travel between the borders. Uh, so it's easy for people to make business and it's easy for people to travel between our two countries. Um, as an example, also last uh, year, uh, at the end of 2010, we signed an uh, open air agreement with the EU, which uh, uh, is an agreement that allowed uh, any airline, European airline, to um, uh, fly uh, without any restrictions uh, to Georgia, which resulted in doubling the number of airlines that fly today to Georgia, resulted in the need of construction of a new airport in the, uh, next to the second largest uh, city of Georgia, and attraction of low budget airlines, which automatically increased uh, number of tourists and increased number of business uh, and trade that happens in the country. So having this type of uh, legal uh, agreements between uh, neighboring countries and um, uh, as Minister mentioned, 25% uh, of uh, trade happens between your neighboring countries. So it's important that you make sure that uh, the legal arrangements are uh, strong, um, that you have uh, efficiency uh, in the uh, system itself, the uh, bureaucracy is on the uh, minimum level as possible, and that you, for the long uh, term, invest into the education of uh, your society. Thank you, Minister Kobaria. As uh, uh, trade agreements between neighboring countries help increase trade, uh, uh, but uh, I would like to address the second question. How do the agreements work on the ground? Maybe, uh, Mr. Simon, you would like to elaborate a little bit on that. Well, once those agreements are in place, we normally evaluate the uh, business opportunities, and uh, we do that in a way by bringing own people on the ground, and then we uh, first understand the local uh, rules, habits, and regulations. Having done that, we kind of consider what is the investment needs. And normally we go, we either buy a company or we partner with somebody who has local know-how or we go greenfield. Now, each of the different ways to enter has its pros and cons. In a way, if you buy a company, especially in, uh, in, in emerging markets, you have some, sometimes surprises on, on uh, uh, certain regulatory uh, uh, activities when you bought the company you want to integrate it. But on the positive, you always already have a market understanding. Immediately you buy kind of a customer base, you buy uh, uh, know-how. If you partner, that's also we did, uh, only to give you a figure, we bought in the last 10 years about 40 companies worldwide. So uh, if you partner, I think that's for us also, uh, uh, we, we use in some markets where we're sure that our progress in the local market will be faster if you go together with a local entrepreneur or who somebody already has uh, a certain infrastructure, know-how in the market. Then the other one is Greenfield, where we decide to start it from scratch. Now that's kind of a, a slower process because you start to invest in local resources. The advantage is you can bring your own systems in. So if you have global operating systems, global finance systems, you start it from scratch, go slower, but you're sure that you have a, a, a sound base and, and you have in this area, you have less struggle. So in a way, that's how we get those things then on the ground. Uh, thank you. Interesting points. Let's open it up uh, uh, for questions. Uh, please identify yourselves and your company if you have a question. Yes, please. Saleh Al Husseini from Saudi Arabia, MP. I think uh, we have on one side for example, the GCC total import is 260 billion. It's a good trade in the region. On the other hand, when you look at the region, you will find Algeria, Libya, Sudan, uh, Somal, Yemen, Iraq, Syria, Palestine, they are totally outside the trade system, the global trade system. They are not part of the WTO. And this is a critical question to develop this. On the other hand, you see the GCC total import is 260 is equivalent to the total import of India, which is a big market. Thank you. And, and this is for who? 
Anybody can. Anybody who would like to answer, I guess. Maybe. Um, I, I, okay, please go ahead. No, I, I, I think the point is very well taken that uh, success requires integration into the world economy. And the exercise of actually joining something like the World Trade Organization is very painful for countries, but also requires them to reevaluate the strategies which they've been followed, following. And Saudi Arabia went through quite a, a, a very painful process for quite a long time, uh, but I think it was all to the good. So I think other countries um, are, uh, that, that still have not even acceded to the WTO, which is sort of a minimal standard, um, really are, um, uh, have, have to get in line because um, that's a, a, just the first step mm -hmm. in getting trade policies in order. We've elaborated on the many other things that have to also work on the ground, but nonetheless it is a precondition. So I think the question is very well taken. And, uh Mrs. Anderson, would you like to add something? Yeah, just to add that in a sense, you know, you do have in this world the trade haves and the trade have nots. And I think that that's what the question is, is highlighting. And, and maybe there is a lesson here for us to reflect on for the Middle East and North Africa region because parameters have shifted. What was yesterday is not today and tomorrow. We're no longer just trading services or, or, or commodities. We're trading tasks. Services even is of yesterday, right? We're trading tasks. That, and so we're no longer looking at the, the uh, Moroccan factory, the Sudanese factory. We're looking at the Asian factory. A thing is produced one place, assembled another, moved a, uh, added value in a third place, and so on. And the whole thing is integrated with the logistics that you were talking about. And so f there is a mindset switch that as these borders have now come down in many of the Middle East and North Africa region, as we're no longer talking of countries that are connected on a continent but speaking as islands, as we're talking about integration, well, that's where opportunities will become uh, uh, possible. So I think you're putting very much your finger on the, on the issue here that how to drive that greater integration. Um, WTO is a long trip and a long journey and one that uh, countries have embarked upon uh, with great gain. Um, some of those that were mentioned in the example may not be the first ones that might line up in that line, but beginning to figure out what is it that you do beyond, behind the border? What, what do you need to do on your photosanitary, on your sanitary, on your norms, on your customs, on your regulatory framework, all of that stuff will be good in the long run to ensure that you can then move more uh, positively and with greater great gain into the global markets. As you say, Mrs. Anderson, it's a good point. There is a need for greater integration. And what do we need to do uh, beyond the border? That's uh, what we need to uh, think about, I believe. Uh, Minister Chalian, do you have a uh, point to add? Evet, ben de bir şeyler eklemek istiyorum. Söyle ki, Türkiye, Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nün kurucusu olan bir ülke ve 3 yıldır Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nün yapmış olduğu toplantılara bizzat ben ve ekibim çok aktif katılım sağlıyoruz. Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nün her toplantısında ifade etmiş olduğum husus bugün Dünya Ticareti Örgütü'ne üye olmamış ve Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nün belirlemiş olduğu kuralların dışında hareket etmek durumunda olan ülkeleri de bir şekilde Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nde üyeliğini sağlanması gerekiyor. Ben arkadaşımın gerçekten sorusunu fazlasıyla önemsiyorum. Ve bu noktada bilhassa Orta Doğu'da, Kuzey Afrika'da ve Avrasya coğrafyasında ihracatının, üretiminin daha fazlasını bu bölgede yoğunlaştırmış olan bir Türkiye olarak tabii ki birlikte iş yapmış olduğumuz ülkelerin Dünya Ticaret Örgütü kurallarına entegre olması bir kere kendi ülkem adına son derece bunu önemli görürken bir haksız rekabet unsuru ortaya çıkartmamasını sağlamak adına bunu önemli görürken Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'ne şu anda üyelik sürecinde olan veya şu anda üyelik için başvurmasa dahi o bölgedeki ve diğer bölgelerdeki birçok ülkenin de geçiş maliyetlerinin bir şekilde sağlanarak <gülüyor> bu ülkelere gerekli reformları yapacak, gerekli düzenlemeleri yapacak belli bir süre ve bunun maliyetlerini de bir şekilde karşılanarak bu ülkelerin de mutlak surette bu kuralın içine sokulması gerekiyor. Yani bir futbol maçına çıkıyorsunuz. Siz bir ülke olarak 
Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'ne üyesiniz. UEFA kurallarına göre oynuyorsunuz. Ama diğer karşınızdaki rakip Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'ne üye değil ve UEFA kuralları onun için geçerli değil. Şimdi nasıl bir maç yapacaksınız? Bu karşılaşma nasıl olacak? Bu karşılaşmada kurallar neye göre çalışacak? Bu noktada Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nün her toplantısında ben bu işin Türkiye'deki görevlisi bakan olarak mutlak surette Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'ne üye olamamış olan ülkelerin mutlaka sistem için entegrasyonu önemsiyorum. Örneğin Rusya Federasyonu'nun bu yıl yapılan törenle Dünya Ticaret Örgütü üyesi olması son derece önemsiyorum. Ve diğer taraftan da Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nde bazı ülkelerin yapmış olduğu engellemelerin de aslında bir an önce normalleşme sürecine girerek bu konuda çok önemli yapacağı çalışmalar olduğunu inanıyorum. Maalesef küresel krizler ülkelerde aşırı korumacılık refleksini geliştirebiliyor. Ülkeler ister istemez özel sektöründe gelen baskısıyla çok aşırı korumacılığa girebiliyor. Ama Dünya Ticaret Örgütü'nde bu kuralların nasıl olduğu, korumacılığın nasıl yapılacağı çok net bellidir. Ve Türkiye olarak biz de sonuna kadar ticaretin serbestleştirmesinden yana tavır almış olan bir ülkeyiz. We're in the last five minutes, so we have just one uh, question. We can take one more question, a brief question, please. Hello? No? If there... Hello? Please. Hi. Uh, my name is Ravi Subramanian. I'm a global shaper from Mumbai. I have a question for uh, Minister Kavalia. Uh, you said, you know, Georgia lacks, no, um, you said Georgia lacks, you know, certain skills, uh, you know, which, which need to be addressed. And uh, in any economy, it's actually the small and medium enterprises which create jobs. Uh, so do you, are you taking any policy measures to incentivize, you know, SMEs from outside to actually come and set up business in Georgia? Absolutely. Um, that's a good question because we believe that uh, our economy uh, should be based on small and medium business and this would be the right way to build a sustainable economy for years to come. Um, in terms of uh, attracting small and medium business from uh, other countries, we are very open. Um, as I said, we are a, a small country with a small market, so it makes sense for us to have uh, an open market economy. And uh, in terms of uh, privatization of uh, uh, real estate or land, um, it's um, uh, the same rules and regulations for foreign investors as it is for uh, local uh, businesses in Georgia. Mm -hmm. So it's basically as open as it could be. Uh, we have uh, uh, small and medium businesses investing from uh, Asia, including from India, in different uh, uh, business sectors, including the ICT sector, um, uh, with the data centers and call centers right now, it's becoming more and more uh, increasing uh, business uh, opportunity. Uh, also, in terms of the agricultural sector, uh, there has been a lot of movement because we believe in order to um, increase uh, the levels uh, uh, be right now, agricultural sector is probably the uh, the one sector that's lagging behind in Georgia. So uh, we are uh, attracting uh, new technologies to the sector and we believe in countries where this sector is developed and where new technologies have been implemented for years to come are a good example where businesses from those two countries can come and invest in Georgia and build on the productivity levels and uh, build on the opportunities that are available. Um, you can see that in Georgia, 40, uh, more than 40% of the population is involved in the agricultural sector but only uh, it's only 9% to GDP so there's a huge um, uh, opportunity in this sector uh, with um, uh, different uh, crops uh, uh, growing and uh, export markets available in our neighboring countries so uh, the country is open for all types of uh, foreign investments and um, it's uh, open including in the agricultural and this sector is the, in and the minister Kovalya Sure. Thank you so much for your insights. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Uh, thank. Um, I would like to thank all of our panels. It was a great session. Uh, and uh, let's clap for our panels. Thank you. You're welcome to Georgia. <laughs> <That was good. laughs>